Good afternoon. This is Nancy Archibald from the Integrated Care Resource Center, or ICRC. Thank you all for joining us today for this Working with Medicare webinar entitled Medicare 101, an introduction to Medicare benefits and the roles of Medicare and Medicaid in serving duly eligible individuals, which is part of ICRC's training curriculum developed to assist states in better working with Medicare. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. For those of you who are joining us by phone, you can view um, the uh, slides by logging into Zoom. You'll find instructions for doing that in the appointment for today's webinar. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's presentation. Mm -hmm. We will have a Q&A segment at the end but we'll keep the phone lines muted, so we ask that you submit your questions uh, via Zoom using the Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit those questions at any time during the webinar. As usual, we'll be recording the call so that you can revisit today's presentation or share the recording with colleagues who were unable to join today. And as you leave the webinar, a short evaluation will pop up on your screen. We ask that you just take a minute and fill that out so you can share some feedback with us. Next slide. Today's webinar is part of ICRC's Working with Medicare webinar series, as I said, which is designed to help state Medicaid agency staff learn more about the Medicare program and how to use that knowledge as they work to improve coordination of Medicare and Medicaid benefits for individuals who are dually eligible for both programs. The webinars in this series include this one on Medicare 101 and then three others on coordination of Medicare and Medicaid behavioral health benefits, Medicare and Medicaid nursing facility benefits, and state contracting with these NIPs. The recordings and slides from these other webinars are also archived on our website, along with all kinds of other resources, briefs, and e-alerts. Mm -hmm. And you can receive, sign up to receive notices about upcoming webinars or new resources by uh, going to the ICRC website, the uh, link you can see there on the screen, and signing up for those to receive those e-alerts. Next slide. During today's webinar, we'll start with some background information on dually eligible individuals. And uh, I believe you should have all received an e alert today uh, with a link to a brand new um, infographic that ICRCC has developed. If you're not that familiar with the dually eligible population, we'll be referencing that. We'll also provide you with a brief introduction to the Medicare program. And we'll talk about the roles of Medicare and Medicaid in serving duly eligible populations. Then we'll conclude with a beneficiary profile that really mm -hmm. helps illustrate some of the fragmentation and lack of coordination faced by duly eligible individuals. This Thursday, March 25th, also in this 1230 to 130 Eastern Time block, we'll host part two of this webinar which will cover slightly more advanced topics related to Medicare. And if you haven't already signed up, if you'd like to attend that one, you'll find registration information on the calendar section on the homepage of ICRC's website. Next slide. Our speakers today are Danny Para, Anna Thomas, and Kelsey Cowan. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Danny, who's gonna start our presentation. Great, thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. My name is Danny Para, and in this first section today, we'll be going over some of the basics of what it means to be a dually eligible individual. So here to start, here are some basics. You may recognize some of this section from a fact sheet that Nancy mentioned is posted on the ICRC website and was sent around to you before this webinar. Please feel free to refer to that fact sheet and let me know in the Q&A box if you have any questions. So to become a duly eligible, an individual must qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. 
I'll briefly describe here some of the different ways that that could occur. So there are two different ways that someone could become dually eligible, or be, I'm sorry about that, so could become dual eligible for Medicare. They must be either 65 and older or under 65 with a permanent disability or chronic illness, including different intellectual or developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, or behavioral health needs, just to name a few. Also, an individual at any age with end-stage renal disease can qualify for Medicare. Now, there are also a variety of ways that an individual can become eligible for Medicaid as well. These requirements do vary state by state, but are related to income and asset levels for the individual. So to become duly eligible, an individual needs to qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid meeting the federal requirements for Medicare and the state requirements for Medicaid. So why do we care about this? Uh, duly eligible individuals are a high needs population. There are 12.2 million individuals enrolled in both Medicare and Medicaid. And there's a high prevalence between this population and having another health condition, functional limitations or social risk factors. Because of this high prevalence, duly eligible beneficiaries have a higher share of Medicare and Medicaid spending than typical enrollees. And as you can see by this infographic at the bottom of our slide here, while the proportion of duals enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid are low, we're looking at around 20% for Medicare and 15% uh, for Medicaid, they have disproportionate spending, making them a key population to be aware of for both in practice policy and in practice. The most prevalent chronic conditions among duly eligible beneficiaries do vary by age, which is important to note. So for example, among duly eligible beneficiaries who are over the age of 65, hypertension and ischemic heart disease are especially prevalent, whereas behavioral health conditions are highly prevalent among duals under the age of 65. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us in different ways, but duly eligible individuals have been particularly impacted due to their potential key risk factors that we had just discussed. There are existing gaps in the healthcare system that have been highlighted over the past year uh, that make coordination of care, which was already a difficult area to navigate, more complicated. I'll point out here that CMS has created a data snapshot about duly eligible individuals having a higher prevalence of COVID-19 infection and hospitalization when compared to Medicare-only individuals. I do also want to note that duly eligible individuals are not a monolith. Different subpopulations of this group have been affected by the pandemic in different ways. So individuals using home and community-based services may have had their care disrupted. Nursing facility residents may have experienced further isolation and vulnerability to exposure. I'd encourage you to consider the different ways that this vulnerable population may have been affected when thinking about the pandemic and understand the need for coordination of care to support them. To learn more about the effect of COVID-19 on different duly eligible subpopulations, feel free to check out the Center for Healthcare Strategies blog series on this particular topic. Earlier, we discussed ways that someone might qualify as a duly eligible individual, qualifying for both Medicare and Medicaid. From there, there are actually two ways that a Medicare beneficiary can become a duly eligible. They can either qualify as a partial benefit dual or full benefit dual. To be a full benefit dual eligible, a Medicare beneficiary must meet the state Medicaid eligibility requirements. Then they would get full Medicare and Medicaid benefits. If, however, a Medicare beneficiary did not meet the categorical and income and asset levels for full Medicaid benefits in their state, but they do still have low income and assets to qualify for a Medicare savings program, they could qualify as a partial benefit dual eligible. 
there are several different subcategories be between both full and partial benefit eligibilities. But for each of them, it's important to note that they're considered dual eligible because Medicaid will pay for at least some of their Medicare premiums and cost sharing. If you'd like to learn more about these subcategories, the CMS resource linked on this slide has more information. Oftentimes when discussing dually eligible individuals, it be can become really easy to let this stay very hypothetical. For that reason, I wanna highlight a real life example of the benefits of integrated care for people eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So for this, I'll be reading a de-identified story of a duly eligible individual and their experience with integrated care. So this is Carl's story. Self-reliance is something that Carl learned early on when he quit school to work at his family's tobacco farm in order to earn his keep. He drew from this strength years later to cope with the loss of his parents and siblings his only support system. That same resolve was put to the test when he woke one morning to discover that he could no longer stand. He had suffered a massive stroke. While at the hospital for treatment, he received three more life-altering diagnoses, diabetes, depression, and early onset dementia. On top of relearning how to walk and talk, Carl had to contend with these conditions that he didn't know that he had. Feeling frightened and alone, he wondered how he would take care of himself, medically or financially. Now unemployed, he got by for a while thanks to meals from church parishioners and his landlord who let him stay rent free. But he couldn't remember things like he used to and his paralysis was worsening. Without anyone to ask for help, Carl checked himself into a motel. A motel room insulated him from the unknowns of the world outside and was more manageable space to navigate. In lieu of physical therapy, he took it upon himself to walk the perimeter of the motel 20 laps a day, every day with a cane. He failed to keep track of his prescriptions, however, and frequently over-medicated and ended up in the ER. For two years, Carl stayed in that motel, sick and isolated, until he was referred to United Healthcare where he was met with an integrated care approach to support his health needs. United Healthcare helped to secure stable housing and a caregiver for Carl, and he was given personalized care, a personalized care plan that included actual physical therapy, a new medication management program, functional ambulation aids, and long-term primary care physician who provides home-based care too. Today, Carl is living independently in his new apartment where he says he feels safe and cared for. He enjoys the companionship of his caregiver and he has had no ER visits or inpatient admits until since receiving this support from United Healthcare. So Carl's story is an example of a beneficiary greatly benefiting from an integrated program. He was in a situation with an amount of complex socioclinical needs his stroke left him with paralysis, a surprise diagnosis of dementia, major depressive disorder, and diabetes, the social needs regarding housing insecurity. These were all really complex issues. With the assistance of integrated care interventions, however, Carl's needs were able to be met, helping him in securing housing, increased social interaction, and addressing his different care needs. Integrated care programs help in making sure beneficiaries like Carl don't fall through the cracks and address the complexities of their needs. So each state has a different approach and experience in addressing duly eligible individuals. If you'd like to learn more about your state in particular, I would encourage you to use a guide developed by ICRC how states can better understand their duly eligible beneficiaries, a guide to using CMS data resource. ICRC can also assist in gathering data on your particular state through compiling a state data profile at your request. Finally, I would, you can engage with State Data Resource Center, a website that can assist in the process of obtaining Medicare data from CMS including an approved data request and attestations, 
from current and historical data. By using this data, your state can learn more about how they might benefit from integration and coordination in ways that they can streamline care for dually eligible individuals. So this was a very general overview of some of the basics and du of dually eligible individuals. To recap some of the highlights of this section, dually eligible individuals have both Medicare and Medicaid and are both high need and high cost. Because of this, this group has been particularly and disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And states can use integrated care programs to coordinate Medicare and Medicaid benefits, improve care and streamline materials and processes for duly eligible individuals. And I also wanna note that we will talk more about integrated care programs and other actions that states can take to improve care for duly eligible individuals in webinar two of this series later this week. And today we'll be focusing on providing basic information about Medicare and the roles that Medicare and Medicaid play and providing services for duly eligible individuals. With that, I'll pass things along to Anna to give us a brief introduction to Medicare. Thanks, Danny. When working with the duly eligible individuals, it's important to understand the basics of both Medicare and Medicaid in order to understand how both of these programs work in tandem to serve this population. Now we're going to look a little bit more closely at the basics of Medicare. Next slide, please. Medicare is a federal program, so the eligibility requirements for Medicare are the same regardless of what state you live in. There are two ways someone can become eligible for Medicare. The first is if an individual is 65 years old or older and they have enough work history. An individual can qualify for Medicare benefits based on their own work record or the work record of a spouse or ex-spouse. Another way to become eligible for Medicare is if you're under 65 and have a qualifying disability. Therefore, everyone with Medicare benefits is either over the age of 65, has a disability, or in some cases, both. This point is important to keep in mind when thinking about programs and services for dually eligible individuals. Next slide, please. Medicare is broken up into three parts, A, B, and D. Each part covers different benefits as illustrated on the, slide on this, on the chart on this slide. Under Medicare Part A, individuals receive coverage for inpatient services, such as hospital care, hospice, and home health. Under Medicare Part B, individuals receive outpatient services, including doctor's visits, lab and x-ray services, durable medical equipment, and ambulance transportation in emergency services in situations. Part B also covers home health in certain circumstances. Finally, Medicare Part D is a program through which Medicare beneficiaries can purchase prescription drug coverage through private insurance plans. Part C of Medicare is an option through which Medicare beneficiaries can receive their benefits through a managed care plan. Therefore, Part C is not actually a set of benefits at all, but rather a pathway to receive Part A, B, and D benefits through a managed care plan. Part C is also known as Medicare Advantage. Next slide, please. Contrary to what some people may believe, Medicare coverage is not free. Medicare beneficiaries pay monthly premiums, deductibles and copayments, or coinsurances for many Medicare covered services. On this slide, we have provided a summary of the costs that Medicare beneficiaries typically pay. But it is important to note that these costs are covered by Medicaid for dually eligible individuals. For example, while most people do not need to pay a monthly premium for Part A coverage, they will pay a deductible and in some cases coinsurance when they go to the hospital. For Part B, everyone pays a monthly premium plus an annual deductible and a 20% coinsurance for each service received. 
The last two columns in this table provide a summary of costs for individuals who enroll in Part D plans, as well as for people who enroll in Part D plans for prescription drug coverage. Of note is the fact that Medicare Advantage plan premiums do not replace the Part B premium. Medicare beneficiaries must still pay their Part B premium even if they enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. The Part B premium is covered by Medicaid for most duly eligible individuals, regardless of whether or not they enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan or receive their benefits through a, the fee-for-service Medicare program. We'll talk more about the state coverage of Medicare cost sharing later on in this webinar. Next slide, please. This slide shows all the different Medicare and Medicaid coverage options that are available to duly eligible individuals. And as you can see, illustrated in the middle of this slide, among other Medicare coverage options, duly eligible individuals can choose to receive their Medicare coverage from dual eligible special needs plans or otherwise known as DSNPs, a special type of Medicare Advantage plan designed specifically to serve duly eligible individuals. All DSNPs are required to coordinate Medicaid benefits for their enrollees, in addition to covering Medicare benefits. Some DSNPs may also cover Medicaid benefits or align with Medicaid managed care plans to cover those benefits. All of the boxes in green on this slide represent ways that duly eligible individuals can receive coordinated or integrated Medicare and Medicaid benefits. In addition to DSNPs, at the top of the screen are Medicare Medicaid plans and PACE organizations, both of which provide fully integrated Medicare and Medicaid benefits through a single entity. For more information about DSNPs, MMPs, and PACE organizations, see the resources that we have provided at the end of today's slide deck. Next slide, please. In the graph on this slide, we can see that the enrollment in Medicare Advantage plans has grown substantially among the duly eligible population between 2006 and 2019. This graph depicts increases in Medicare Advantage enrollment among both full benefit duly eligible individuals and partial benefit individuals. This trend follows what we have been seeing among individuals who have only Medicare benefits, but the percentage of duly eligible individuals enrolled in MA plans is actually slightly higher than the percentage of all Medicare beneficiaries enrolled in such plans. Though we can see on this graph that approximately 40% of the duly eligible population is enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans, it's still important to remember that 60% of duly eligible individuals are enrolled in fee-for-service Medicare. Taking that into consideration, there is still quite a bit of room to grow enrollment in integrated plans that meet the needs of this population. Next slide, please. In addition to covering required benefits under original Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans can offer additional supplemental benefits. These supplemental benefits can include things like vision, dental, gym membership, and medical transportation. They can also be used to help address social determinants of health, and other barriers that dually eligible individuals face in getting the care that they need to stay healthy and in their homes. Medicare Advantage plans can also utilize supplemental benefits to help reduce member cost sharing. Starting in 2019 and in 2020, Medicare Advantage plans have new flexibilities in the kind of supplemental benefits that they can offer. We will discuss the new supplemental benefit flexibilities in more detail during our 201 webinar on Thursday. Next slide, please. Overall, the key takeaways regarding the Medicare basics that we just covered are as follows. Medicare is a federal health insurance program. And Medicare Part A, B, and D all offer different coverage of Medicare benefit to Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare beneficiaries, including duly eligible individuals, can choose to receive Medicare benefits through Medicare Advantage managed care plans and enrollment in these plans has steadily increased over time. Medicare Advantage plans can provide a variety of supplemental benefits in addition to Part A, B, e, and D benefits. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Kelsey and she will review the roles of Medicare and Medicaid in serving duly eligible individuals. 
Thanks so much, Anna. Uh, so yeah, as Anna mentioned in this section, we'll discuss how Medicare and Medicaid can work together in serving duly eligible individuals. Uh, and we'll focus particularly on some of the coverage gaps in Medicare that Medicaid may fill. Next slide. All right, so this table shows uh, when Medicare and Medicaid each serve as primary payer for certain key benefits for duly eligible individuals. This depiction doesn't show an exhaustive list of benefits, however. Medicare is the primary payer or first payer for many services that duly eligible individuals receive, including inpatient and outpatient care, prescription drugs, ambulance care, labs, etc. Um, however, there are some key coverage gaps in Medicare, like access to non-emergency medical transportation and nursing facility services that are beneficial for duly eligible individuals that Medicaid may cover to address their care needs. When it comes to service types like behavioral health, home health, and durable medical equipment, determining whether Medicare or Medicaid is the primary payer requires a pretty detailed understanding of the services rendered and the care circumstances. So that's why you see that sort of blended orange and blue in that column in the table. Uh, we'll talk about these services in more detail in the next few slides, but in short, some states' Medicaid programs may serve as the primary payer for some of these service types when the services are not covered by Medicare. It's important to note that Medicaid covers these benefits to different extents and in different ways, depending on the state. Next slide. So throughout this section of the presentation, we've highlighted the primary payer for each service at the top of the slide in blue for Medicare and orange for Medicaid. Um, and if ever I slip up and say Medicare twice or Medicaid twice, uh, definitely shoot a chat question in to make sure that we clarify that for you. Uh, so as I mentioned on the previous slide, Medicare is the primary payer for inpatient and outpatient services, such as hospital visits or clinic or office visits. However, Medicaid does provide support for duly eligible individuals to cover monthly Medicare Part B premiums and cost sharing. These services are billed through crossover claims, which will uh, go into more detail, which we will go into more detail about in our second webinar uh, on Thursday. Next slide. In the case of nursing facility services and long-term care, Medicaid covers quite a bit more than Medicare. For duly eligible individuals, Medicare uh, and, and beneficiaries in general, Medicare can only cover short-term skilled nursing stays when an individual needs physical, occupational, speech therapy, or skilled nursing services. And in order to receive those services, eligible individuals must have had a three-day inpatient hospital stay beforehand. Medicaid doesn't have these same limitations. A three-day hospital visit is not required to receive short-term care through Medicaid, and Medicaid also covers long-term services and supports such as assistance with activities of daily living and home and community-based services. Next slide. Uh, now, coverage for uh, or of behavioral health services can be a bit tricky for duly eligible individuals to navigate. This is one of those uh, service types where uh, it's sometimes hard to discern where Medicare covers and where Medicaid covers. So Medicare covers many mental health and substance use disorder services, such as services provided in uh, general and psychiatric hospitals and prescription drugs, including drugs to treat mental health and SUD conditions. However, there are <laughs> limitations to these benefits through Medicare. For example, mental health and SUD services must be provided in a hospital-based setting in order to be covered by Medicare, uh, and they must be approved by an, uh, provided by an approved healthcare professional. Uh, so Medicare only covers certain types of providers, and we've provided references at the bottom of this slide where you can see lists of the type of providers who may receive Medicare payment. 
There are also limits to the length of stay in psychiatric care under Medicare. Uh, so Medicaid can fill these coverage gaps in a variety of ways for duly eligible individuals, including through coverage of optional behavioral health services in the state plan, or through lessened restrictions on benefits, or by covering a broader array of mental health and SUD treatment providers. Next slide. So here we're going to dig into a few different uh, behavioral health related benefits that Medicare and Medicaid covers. Um, so with this one, as of January 2020, uh, Medicare provides bundled payments through Part B for opioid use disorder treatment services. So this program covers FDA approved medication assisted treatment, substance use counseling, and periodic, periodic assessments, uh, to name just a few of the benefits on the slide here. States were recently mandated in December of 2020 to cover similar opioid treatment benefits and Medicaid may cover any benefits that's, that are not currently covered through this Medicare opioid treatment programs for uh, duly eligible individuals. Next slide. Um, so Medicaid covers uh, institutions for mental health, or sorry, mental diseases uh, services or IMD services. So historically, Medicaid programs have not been able to receive federal matching payments for services rendered in institutions for mental diseases or IMDs. However, in recent years, CMS has allowed states to cover these services through several avenues, including through waivers or as in lieu of services offered by managed care plans. Uh, and so for more details on IMDs, there are a few resources on this slide as well for you. Next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about home health care. Like with nursing facility services, for home health services, Medicare requires uh, those services to be skilled care, like physical or occupational therapy. Additionally, Medicare requires that beneficiaries be homebound. Uh, Medicaid, on the other hand, covers home health services in a wire, wider range of circumstances or may cover those services in a wider range of circumstances. So for example, Medicaid does not require that beneficiaries be homebound for duly eligible individuals in the cases where um, Medicare can't cover a home health service, Medicaid may become the primary payer uh, for those services. Next slide. Uh, durable medical equipment like wheelchairs uh, follows a similar pattern um, to the home health services. Medicare coverage is limited to durable medical equipment used primarily in the home, while Medicaid coverage includes equipment that beneficiaries can use in a variety of settings where normal life activities take place. Uh, again, in the circumstances for which Medicare is limited, Medicaid may pay for uh, may become the primary payer for such services to duly eligible individuals. Next slide. So the final benefit that we'll look at in detail today is non-emergency medical transportation services. Uh, and in this circumstance, Medicaid is the primary payer. So Medicare does cover emergency ambulance services or non-emergency ambulance transportation with medical necessity. Uh, and Medicaid may cover and pay for travel expenses by ambulance, taxi, or other appropriate modes uh, for duly eligible individuals to get to their exams or treatment. Uh, so non-emergent situations. Next slide. All right, so to highlight some of the key takeaways from this uh, section, Medicare is often the primary payer for services a duly eligible individual may need. But there are some core coverage gaps for which Medicaid may pay for duly eligible individuals. Medicaid coverage really depends on the specific services rendered, the circumstances involved, and the state's own Medicaid plan, but may include long-term services and supports, non-emergency medical transportation, behavioral and home health services, and durable medical equipment. Additionally, Medicaid covers Part A and B premiums and cost sharing. Next slide. 
Okay, so we've covered a lot of information on Medicare and Medicaid coverage for duly eligible individuals. So we'd like to walk through a beneficiary case study to demonstrate how this might roll out in practice, highlighting in particular what could happen if Medicare and Medicaid benefits are not coordinated. Next slide. So we've put a, a scenario on the slide here. Uh, Sam is a duly eligible individual who is enrolled in fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid. Sam recently experienced a car accident on the highway. In addition to sustaining severe physical injuries, which require the use of a wheelchair and extensive physical therapy, Sam is also demonstrating symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So after his accident, in addition to his uh, pre-existing conditions, Sam requires long-term physical therapy, durable medical equipment, aka a wheelchair, mental health services, transportation to and from doctor's visits, and prescription medication. Next slide. Um, so Danny hi hi highlighted at the beginning of the webinar some of the benefits of integrated care for duly eligible individuals in Carl's story. Uh, so in this scenario, we're gonna focus on Sam's experience finding a wheelchair, uh, really dig into that example to highlight the implications of fragmented services for duly eligible individuals. So you'll have uh, fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid experience and, and cost implications on the left-hand side of the screen and uh, the same scenario worked out with integrated care. Uh, so with fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Sam doesn't have access to a care coordinator. So Sam and Sam's physician have to find a durable medical equipment provider on their own. Uh, so Sam must call several DME providers in order to find a wheelchair. The first company that Sam calls is not a Medicaid provider, and the second company declines Sam's request because of payment uncertainty and challenges when they serve duly eligible individuals within their state. Uh, so Sam ends up staying at the nursing facility that he was that they were placed in for much longer than they'd like while they find a provider for their wheelchair and navigate DME providers within their state. While Sam is staying at the nursing facility for longer than he'd like, Medicaid is billed for nursing facility services when Sam's Medicare coverage ends. So that's what rolls out for fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid. With integrated care, Sam has access to a care coordinator through their integrated care plan who connects Sam to relevant resources for their care needs. Sam's care coordinator identifies the durable medical equipment provider for a wheelchair soon after Sam indicates that they're ready to go home. Uh, and then Sam, because now they now have access to a wheelchair, returns home when they are ready and Medicaid pays only for the services that are necessary based on Sam's care needs and care wishes. Um, so this scenario only highlights the complexities for durable medical equipment, but there are many other services that Sam needs like behavioral health, where the relationship between Medicare and Medicaid is equally, if not more so, complex. Um, and as we discussed earlier, many duly eligible individuals have three or more chronic conditions and systemic behavioral health needs, making it particularly challenging to navigate a complicated system on their own. Next slide. Uh, so separate siloed Medicare and Medicaid systems, like we said, like we highlighted, can be challenging for duly eligible individuals to navigate, especially when certain benefits like durable medical equipment and behavioral health may be covered by both programs, but in different circumstances and with different coverage rules. So in the next webinar, we'll discuss steps that states can take to improve the quality and coordination of Medicare and Medicaid benefits for duly eligible individuals. Um, and now I'll turn it back over to Nancy for questions. Great, thanks so much, Kelsey, and to Anna and Danny for your presentations today. So we are gonna have a good bit of time now to uh, start to answer your questions. Again, please use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. 
And uh, joining us for the Q&A portion, we also have uh, some more of our ICRC bench here. We have Aaron weirlock Mani, Danielle Chelminski, and Jim Verdeer, in addition to Danny and Kelsey and Anna to answer your questions. Um, and we're starting to get a few things in. Let's, let me start with one. So um, someone asked, if a member still has to pay premiums for Medicare Part B, this is someone who is enrolled in a, in a Medicare Advantage plan, how is Medicare Advantage advantageous in a, from a standpoint of cost efficiency for the member? So I'll, I'll start that one and uh, invite others to join in. So. Um, so, yes, the, the enrollees still have to pay that Medicare Part B premium, but uh, there are many Medicare Advantage plans, including uh, the dual eligible special needs plans, that offer um, zero, zero dollar premiums for joining the plan. So they wouldn't potentially have to pay any more to join the plan. Mm -hmm. And Medicare Advantage plans many, many of them offer supplemental benefits like vision, dental, hearing services, as um, Anna was saying, potentially transportation benefits that are not covered under Medicare fee-for-service. So that's a very popular benefit of Medicare Advantage plans, and it uh, really brings a great deal of value to um, enrollees. So... Um, we have some questions around DME. Um, so I'm going to start. Let's go over to um, back to Kelsey for a second. And Kelsey, I'm going to ask you to give an example of the kinds of durable medical equipment that Medicare will not cover. Could you just give us an example there? Yeah, for sure. So one example might be equipment that the individual uses to support mobility outside of the home. So if the beneficiary is able to move short distances unassisted and therefore doesn't need mobility assistance within their home, Medicare wouldn't cover any uh, mobility assistance like motorized wheelchairs or scooters to support mobility uh, outside of the home. Um, and if folks are interested in more information on how to coordinate Medicare and Medicaid durable medical equipment coverage, there is a um, piece on the ICRC website called Facilitating Access to Medicaid Durable Medical Equipment for Duly Eligible Beneficiaries. It's a uh, uh, three-state case study. Great. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so kind of related to this, I'm going to ask um, either Aaron or Jim, I think. Someone has asked us how Medicare defines the term homebound. What does it mean for someone to be homebound? So I'm happy to answer that one, Nancy. Um, and we can certainly try to provide a more specific um, regulatory reference in the chat, if I can pull it up here while we're talking. The, the definitions for the benefits that are covered by Medicare Part A and Part B are in sections 409 and 410, 409 and 410 of chapter 42 of the Code of Federal Regulations. So all of the regulations around Medicare coverage of, of specific benefits can be found in chapter 42 sections 409 and 410. And so the, um, the definition of homebound is, is definitely going to be in there under home health coverage. And it's also provided in the guidance manuals um, that Medicare uses to guide coverage of care. The Medicare benefit policy manual, for example, has a very specific definition as well. But the, the lay person definition that I can provide off the top of my head is that it needs to be especially taxing for an individual to leave their home. So homebound does not mean that the person never ever leaves their home. Um, they can leave their home for medical appointments, for adult day services, um, for things like religious services, but it has to be very difficult for that person to leave their home without assistance. 
Um, so hopefully that's you know sufficient for the meantime. But as I said, if you want the very, very specific policy definition, look at the home health benefit coverage requirements in sections 409 and 410 of chapter 42 um, of the code of federal regulations. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, so another another question, uh, this is actually on the, the, the uh, illustration of Sam. So Danny, I'm gonna ask you, can we go back in the slide deck back to the um, comparison of, there, there you go. Um, the next slide on the comparison. There you go. So um, we have a question. Uh, Kelsey, can you can you explain for us again? Uh, the person wants to know whether it was Medicare or Medicaid that ends up paying for Sam's wheelchair. Um, and I think so. Um, th there's a little bit of confusion um, around. Um, what happens when a DME provider says that they don't accept Medicaid and what, what happens in that, in that instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I think a point of clarification, especially on the, um, uh, on company B there that declines the Sam's request because of payment uncertainty and challenges related to duly eligible individuals, there are in a lot of cases uh, states might require that DME providers um, uh, get a Medicare denial uh, to their claim before submitting a claim to Medicaid, um, which uh, is the source of that payment uncertainty for company B. Um, so that might be the case there. I think in terms of who ends up covering the wheelchair, um, I saw a little bit of back and forth in the Q&A box about this. Uh, I think it does depend on whether Sam needs that wheelchair for uh, moving around his home, which he likely would given his physical injuries from the um, from the car accident, Medicare would likely be the primary payer for his durable medical equipment. Uh, if there was additional assistance that he or equipment he needed to use outside of the home, then Medicaid would be the payer for that. Does that clarify things, Nancy? I, I think so. I'm, I'm sure uh, the person will let us know <laughs> if, if we haven't if we haven't got it. Um, yes, we have. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's here's another um, question. Um, so how does a client or, or individual go from being in fee for service to um, going into Part C, and how do they they navigate their choices? So I, I can start on this, and I appreciate uh, others joining in with thoughts. So. When an individual becomes duly eligible for Medicare and, and Medicaid, let's say that they um, were uh, turning 65 and now they will be eligible for Medicare or doesn't matter if they, if they have had a disability and now they're coming in um, because of that disability status. The individual is automatically um, in the fee-for-service original Medicare, unless they choose to go and enter a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, the Part C plan. And they can do that um, through the annual open enrollment period in the fall and winter, or um, because they're duly eligible, they have the ability to um, make a quarterly, on a quarterly basis, they can, they can decide to to enroll in a managed care plan, in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, there are a variety of resources out there, and you, know, you are correct, there are a huge number of different plans available in, in most areas around the country. And so there are a variety of resources that can help an individual. Um, most uh, commonly, people turn to their state health insurance programs, their, their SHIP programs in their states. There are different um, names for those programs in different states, but they provide counseling around um, different options for Medicare Advantage. I hope so. That's helpful. Um, others on ICRC have um, any more to add there? 
Nancy, I would just uh, add that CMS has on its website uh, a variety of resources to help people choose Medicare Advantage plans, including DSNPs, uh, things like uh, the star ratings of quality and access, uh, the services covered by particular plans, and things of that sort. It's uh, uh, a reasonably easy to navigate website, so worth a look. Thanks, Jim. And I see several questions in, in the Q&A on um, very specific uh, questions about eligibility and um, things like that. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry, we're really not equipped to, to handle those questions for you today, but um, we can either pass those along um, to our colleagues at MMCO or um, again, as, as we were saying, uh, refer to your, your state SHIP program for more information. Um, let's maybe cover some different questions. We have um, one on who is responsible for designing and implementing uh, integrated care coordination. And that's, that's a really great question. Um, so while, while I'm gonna start to talk, Danny, could you, could you flip back to that giant flow chart of all the Medicare and Medicaid options for duly eligible individuals. So um, we had in our, our chart here a bunch of different, there we go, a bunch of different um, options for individuals to get integrated Medicare and Medicaid. And you see those in green. So you have PACE programs or the program of all-inclusive care for le for the elderly, those are uh, sort of locally based programs. You find them sometimes in some of the larger cities and, and towns. And those are usually through a provider organization, often a health system. Um, and in that case, it is uh, the PACE organization that is responsible really for um, designing their their program within a, a set of rules that are laid out by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services about what those programs should entail. The Medicare Medicaid plans uh, are operating in nine states under a demonstration that's run by CMS. There are, um, again, some um, contractual rules developed by uh, the federal government and states for how those plans run and operate. And um, the design is, is more or less standardized across those plans. The dual eligible special needs plans are um, uh, health plans uh, with names that you probably recognize. Again, they are um, following guidance from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services about what those plans and the sort of the minimum standards that those plans have to operate under for to be a dual eligible special needs plan. plan. States also have the opportunity to um, further refine those programs to, toward a more integrated uh, model and that you see the sort of um, dotted dotted green lines on the screen going over to the Medicaid side. So um, those DSNPs can, can align with Medicaid managed care, acute care plans, or the MLTSS, the managed long-term services and support plans, or Medicaid managed behavioral health plans. And so mm -hmm. there are opportunities to provide better coordination and communication and information sharing across both the Medicare and Medicaid sides of those, those products. So I hope that's, that's um, helpful to you. Um, let's see. Um, so let's see. Um, so there was a question about requirements for accessing Medicare data. And um, again, uh, we had some options there. I think probably the State Data Resource Center is the, um, probably the best source for um, states trying to access um, Medicare data to build integrated care programs. 
Um, there are also some publicly available data on CMS's website that could be helpful um, if you're just trying to get some more basic information about um, the duly eligible individuals in your state. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Danny, I, I know um, you you thought about this some more. Um, if if someone wants to see, for example, what prevalent chronic conditions there are in the, the duly eligible population in a particular state, how would they do that? Sorry there, I uh, was muted. Um, but I, Nancy, thank you. I would echo a bit of what you s mentioned with the State Data Resource Center. Um, there's the CMS provides publicly available data um, on uh, specifically mm -hmm. on these issues and on chronic conditions. Um, so the State Data Resource Center has some resources that can help you navigate that. Um, also, uh, I, if you're interested in having a more particular uh, profile on your state, um, ICRC provides some assistance at state request, if that's something that you're interested in. Great. Thanks, Danny. Um, then we had a question about um, what we were talking about, the enrollment periods for duly eligible individuals. Um, Aaron, do you want to uh, just mention something about that real quick? Um, yeah, so we had seen a, a question about um, enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan. There was somebody who thought that um, a duly eligible individual could enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan at the beginning of any month, but we said quarterly. Um, and so I wanted to take the time to note that um, in the last couple of years, the special enrollment period that enabled duly eligible individuals to change their plan once a month was changed to a quarterly special enrollment period. So that is something that changed nationwide. Um, it is no longer the case that duly eligible individuals can change their plans once a month. It is now once a quarter. However, um, in states that have demonstrations under the Financial Alignment Initiative, um, those states have chosen to waive that change for the purposes of the financial alignment initiative demonstration only. So it is possible for a duly eligible individual who lives in an area with, a, with Medicare Medicaid plans through the financial alignment initiative to enroll in one of those Medicare Medicaid plans at any time during the year or to disenroll from one of those plans or to change their Medicare Medicaid plan. But that's the only exception for enrolling in regular Medicare Advantage plans or DSNPs, duals can do that once a quarter, not once a month anymore. Great, thanks, Erin. Um, and I think just one last quick question. Um, someone had a uh, question about the difference between DSNPs or the dual eligible special needs plans and Medicare Advantage plans. So uh, the dual eligible special needs plans or DSNPs are a subtype of Medicare Advantage plan. The DSNPs can only enroll duly eligible individuals. The so Medicare Advantage plan, you can enroll in a just a regular Medicare Advantage plan if you're a duly eligible individual. But um, the the dual eligible special needs plans can only enroll duly eligible individuals, and they must coordinate uh, with that individual's um, Medicare, or sorry, Medicaid um, coverage. Um, and there's some other specific rules on that. And I would um, suggest that you look at our um, December webinars, the Working with Medicare webinars from December, in which we specifically um, dive into uh, the dual eligible special needs plan. So we are out of time for today. Um, Thank you very much to our three presenters. Um, if you would like to listen to this webinar again and, and look at the, the slides, we will be sending that out to all attendees later on this week. It will also be posted on the website. There will be an evaluation survey popping up as you exit the webinar. As I said, if you have other questions for us that we were not able to get to, 
there's a spot for you to put those in the survey and we can um, have your, your email address and we'll get back to you on that. Um, so please, I hope you'll join us for part two on Thursday where we'll take a, a deeper dive into some of these topics. Um, thank you very much for attending for our partners at CMS and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.